Amen. You can be seated. Our series throughout the summer this year is called The God Who Lives. And we're walking through the stories of Elijah and Elisha that we find in First and Second Kings, in the, the stories of the history of the nation of Israel. These stories offer us a different way of seeing the world, a different way of living, a way of living as though God is real and alive and well and at work in the world and in our lives as well. And so we're looking at these stories and hoping that they shape and form us deeply so that we can come to live as though God is alive in a world that no longer really believes that's so. We're going to come to another story this morning, a shorter story from 2 Kings 4. But before we do that, let's pray that God would speak to us this morning as we open God's word. Lord, it's in your light that we see light. It's in your truth that we find freedom. And it's in your way that we find peace. So come and shine upon us this morning that we might see you and follow. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So do whatever you need to do to listen well to these words from the book that we love. Now there was a woman who had been married to a member of a group of prophets. And she appealed to Elisha, saying, My husband, your servant, is dead. You know how he feared the Lord. And now, someone that he owed money to has come, and they want to take my two children as slaves. Elisha said, What can I do for you? Tell me, what is left in your house? The woman said, I have nothing in the house except one small jar of oil. So Elisha said, go out and borrow containers from your neighbors, not just a few, and then go in, close the door behind you and your sons, and fill them with oil. Set each one aside when it's full. So she went out, left Elisha, closed the door behind her and her sons. They brought her containers, and she kept on pouring. When she had filled all the containers, she said to her son, Bring me another container. He said, There aren't any more containers. And then the oil stopped flowing. She reported this to the man of God, and he said, Go, go. And sell the oil and pay your debt, and you and your sons can live on what remains. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. We're going to look at three things in this story before we make our way here to the table to celebrate the fountain of God's grace. One of the first things that we notice when we really try to get inside this story is that the story's already been going on. As we pick up things, there's clearly a whole lot of action that's already taken place. And we're dropped down right into the middle of the story. And the story we're dropped into is a story of death. We're introduced to a woman. She's been married to a member of one of the groups of prophets. There weren't many left in these days, but he was one of the faithful ones. She goes to Elijah to tell him that her husband, his servant, his disciple, one who had served alongside him, is dead. She's now a widow. No provider, no protector, no advocate. And the grief of that loss is a grief that most of us know well. Worse than that, though, worse than just death, Worse than just the grief of that loss, we find out that this story is under to the shadow of debt. 
that this man owed money to someone. We don't know to whom. We don't know why. We don't know how much. All we know is that the debt cannot be paid. The widow is destitute. She says she has nothing left in the house but a small jar of oil. It's not just a story of death, but a story of a debt she can't pay. And worse than just that, we find out that the collateral for that debt are the two sons. That the creditor has come, the debt's been called in, and because she cannot pay, the creditor's coming for the children. The two sons will be taken off as slaves to pay off this debt to the creditor. Not only is this story under the shadow of death, not only is this story under the shadow of debt, the story is under the shadow of slavery. Imagine her anguish and her despair. A widow who has nothing left, and now they're coming even for the two sons. Somehow the widow gets the two children away from the creditor and runs off to Elisha to plead for help. All of this before the story has even begun. We're plopped down in the middle of this story of death and debt and slavery. The story of a widow who's fallen through the safety nets of Israel, whose husband has died carrying a debt they cannot pay and children that are about to be lost into slavery. First thing we notice is that story of death. But quite quickly, into that story of death comes a miracle. It's a miracle of oil, of a jar that doesn't run out, but fills every other jar she can gather and remains full to the end. It's a miracle. And one of the things to notice about this miracle is that this widow receives this miracle because she receives it by faith that's lived out in obedience. Let me tell you what I mean by that. She receives it by faith that's lived out in obedience. It's interesting that God doesn't just make the oil appear out of nothing, just filling the shelves suddenly, though God could. It's interesting that God doesn't make a pile of money just appear on the floor, though God could. It's interesting that God doesn't send Elisha to the creditor to say, thus says the Lord, cancel her debt, though he could. No, the debt gets paid. Justice is done on both sides. It's a miracle that comes because the woman receives it by faith, lived out in obedience. For this miracle to happen, she has to actually step out. She has to live in faith to receive the gift God gives. She has to go and gather from her neighbor's containers. She has to go home, close and lock the door behind her. She has to pour the oil. They have to go and sell them once they're filled. She has a role to play She has to trust enough to be obedient to what God calls her into. God involves her in the miracle God gives. And not just her, God involves the sons. And God involves the neighbors. The whole community is gathered into what God is doing. They're asked to lend every spare container they can muster. God invites all of them into this miracle and they experience the bounty of God's grace because they step out in faithful obedience. And if you look back through the miracles of God, this is almost always how miracles happen. Jesus' first miracle, the wedding at Cana, turning water into wine. He tells the servants, go and get these giant stone containers and lug them off and fill them and lug them back to the party and present them to the one who is in charge. And when they step out in that obedience, it's turned into the most fabulous wine they've had. Peter and the miraculous catch in Luke 5. Jesus sends him back out, though all night long he hasn't caught a thing. Tells him to throw his nets on the other side of the boat. And when he listens to what Jesus calls him to, the catch is more than the boat can even hold. They have to signal friends to come or the boat would sink. The catch is so grand. In John 9, Jesus heals a blind man by smearing mud on his eyes and telling him to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. He has to go and wash himself, believing that Jesus is up to something in this strange action. Even the feeding of the 5,000 as God's bounty explodes. The disciples are told, go and gather, find what food you can. 
And in the meager offerings of those there, they find five loaves and two fish that Jesus transforms into a meal that feeds 5,000 men plus women and children plus all that is left over. God's miracles are participatory. God involves us in them. God doesn't just do, but invites us to step into the story alongside him, to step out in faith, actual steps of obedience, to receive the bounteous miracles of God. Now by that, don't hear me say that God helps those who help themselves. That get busy and pull yourself up by your bootstraps and we can call that later a miracle because you tried hard enough. This is clearly a miracle, a supernatural thing. The oil in the jar is still there at the end and every container they've gathered is full. And miracles in scripture aren't just party tricks. They're not deus ex machina plot devices to solve unsolvable problems to just keep the story moving. Miracles in scripture are always redemptive. They lean forward to the restoration God is working in the cosmos. They're they're small glimpses of the kingdom of God, the full healing and transformation that God will work one day. When creation is restored, there'll be no hunger. There will be no want. There will be no fear. There will be no death. And this miracle provided to the widow offers us a small glimpse of what that kingdom will look like when it comes into this world of death and despair. The last thing to notice about this miracle, this miracle that comes as she steps out in faithful obedience. She's told to go and gather these containers and not just a few, the prophet instructs her. So she goes and does so. They come home and lock the door behind them. They're still under threat of this creditor coming and hauling the children off to slavery. And they start to pour And the mother is pouring the oil and taking the container. And when it's full, she sets it aside. And a son gives her another. And she fills it up and sets it aside. And they give her another. And they do this over and over again. And she gets to the last one and says, give me another container. And they say, there aren't any more. And at that moment, the oil stops flowing. In Hebrew, the oil, it says it stood. It's not empty. That container is still full. And when the last container they had gathered is also filled The miracle ends. It's enough to pay the debt. And more than ransoming them out of slavery, it's enough for the woman and her two sons to live on, to make a life for themselves, to continue along and not just fall back into debt again. But I wonder what would have happened if they hadn't gathered so many containers? What if it was only a few What if it was only two or three that they had gone out to gather from their neighbors? What then would have happened? Because it sure seems like the miracle given matches her expectations of what God could do. Like God does everything they expect God to do. If they had come with only meager expectations, I think God would have filled those jars and the miracle would have been over. But because they came with every jar they could find, God still fills them all up. Because God is inexhaustible. And the limit of God's grace is not on God's side, but is limited only by our faith and expectations. Which leads me to wonder, could it be that our lives are actually limiting God by our own meager expectations? What if it's our lack of faith? Because we have not come with nearly enough jars to be filled, that we don't experience God's bounty, that maybe because we've learned to measure well-being in our world by material and consumeristic terms, and when we look around, we're pretty well set and have more than enough of just about everything, and so we come to God with only a couple jars, almost all the way full already, with little, if any, room for God to pour anything into our lives. And so we don't see a living God at work in the world because we've made no space for God to actually work. But of course, that's not what our lives are really like. We may have money and stuff. We may live comfortably, but our lives are not okay. We are still in desperate need of help. 
We too live in that same story of death and debt and slavery. And one of the things this story invites us to see is that when we begin to see how deep our need really goes, when we begin to see that we are turned in on ourselves instead of opened up to God and to our neighbors, that our hearts are stone, that our souls are sick, that we are broken and more desperately in need than we ever thought, when we realize how empty the jar is, we can find out that God's grace goes far deeper still. That the only limit on the amount of grace God pours into our lives is the size of container we bring to be filled. And that's one of the reasons that each week we practice what we call a prayer for renewal. That every single week we gather to say that we are sinners that we are broken, that we need God's forgiveness and God's help, that we have lived counter to God's ways. We don't do that every week to knock ourselves down a few pegs. We don't do that every week to wallow in sin or drag ourselves through mud. We name our sin and ask for forgiveness every week so that we might take one more step in, that we might come more deeply into the inexhaustible fountain of God's grace to empty the jar just a little bit more so that we can come with more room for God to fill us up with grace and love. There's this great quote from Tim Keller. He says, The gospel is this, that we are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we are more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. When we come to God believing that we pretty much have it all together, then there isn't a lot of room for God to do anything or pour anything into our lives. We're coming with just a couple of jars, if anything at all. But if we're willing to truly bear our souls, if we're willing to admit the utter depths of need, the emptiness we feel inside, then we find that the miracle of God's grace goes far deeper still. And that brings us to Jesus. The last thing in this story I want to see before we come to the table. As Christians, we believe that every story in the Bible points us somehow to Jesus. After the resurrection on the road to Emmaus, Jesus himself with two disciples, it says, opens the scriptures to them, tells them all the things about himself in all of the scriptures. This story, too, points us to Jesus. This is a story about the need for a redeemer. In Jewish law, there was this thing called a goel, a kinsman redeemer. It was provided that if anyone came into difficult enough circumstances, that they had to sell off some of their inherited land, that they had to sell off themselves or their family members into slavery to settle a debt, that a goel could step in, a kinsman redeemer, that a closely related person could step in and buy back the land or buy back the person out of slavery, redeem them, ransom them. This widow owed a debt. She could not pay. The children were to be taken into slavery. She's living in that story of death, debt, and slavery. Her life is an empty jar. And there is, it seems, no kinsman redeemer. There is no relative who is willing or able to do anything about it. But when no redeemer can be found, God steps in. God takes on that role of redeemer and miraculously provide. God finds a way to pay the debt that she couldn't. God ransoms them out of slavery. God sets them free. God is their goel. And the scriptures are clear. They point to it over and over again that Jesus is our ultimate redeemer, that he is our closely related brother who steps in to pay the debt we can't pay. Paul says, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, everyone, and the wages of sin are death. There's a debt we cannot pay, and because we cannot pay it, we're destined to lives of slavery, to sin, and to death. Whether we like it or not, that's the story of our lives. That's the story of creation since the fall. We live in a story of death, 
and debt and slavery. But when we could not pay, at the 11th hour, a miracle happens. One steps in and offers to pay the debt we can't. One ransoms us out of slavery to sin and death, redeems us and sets us free. And friends, the miracle of the cross and resurrection through which Jesus pays that debt, the miracle of the cross and resurrection is an inexhaustible fountain of grace. It's a full jar that will never run out, filling whatever container we bring to it. And so if we come to the foot of the cross, believing that we're pretty much full already, that we've got it together, that we may have a couple small needs or emergencies here or there for which we can pray, but that we've done pretty well providing for ourselves and that we're good people, if we come with only a couple of jars, that's all that's going to be filled. But if we come to the foot of the cross, realizing that our need goes deeper than we could ever imagine, that even our noblest of deeds are selfish and self-serving, admitting the emptiness we know is inside, when we come as the empty jars that we are, we find ourselves filled to the brim with the grace of Jesus Christ. And one of the places where we receive that grace most clearly is here at the table. Here at Jesus' table, we eat the bread which is broken and given, but which never seems to run out. We drink from the cup that is poured out every time and yet is never any less full. We come to this table where Jesus gives himself to us, where God, by grace and grace alone, fills up our empty and broken vessels. And we come to participate here in the miracle that points us toward the culmination of God's kingdom. We gather at this table to be assured that the story of our lives is no longer a story of death and debt and slavery but has been transformed by this miracle into a story of abundant and everlasting life because our lives have been taken up into the story of the God who lives. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Friends, let's respond to the word of God by proclaiming what it is Christians believe in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Would you stand? I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You can be seated. As we gather at the table, you can begin to ready your communion elements as well. Again, if you need any, there are some prepackaged over in the welcome tent, a uh, little jars of grape juice and some crackers in there so that you can participate along with us and taste and see that the Lord indeed is good. Brothers and sisters, this feast we're about to celebrate is a feast of remembrance, communion, and hope. As we said, we come remembering all that God has done for us in Jesus, that it is Christ who pays the debt we cannot pay, that it is him who steps in and offers himself as that jar that will never be exhausted to cover over all the sin and brokenness in our lives and in all the world, we come remembering what God has done for us in Jesus Christ and the overflowing of God's grace that we have seen. We come to have communion with that same Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who promises to be with us always, even to the end of the age, who makes himself known to us, 
as the true heavenly bread that strengthens us to life eternal and as the true vine in whom we must abide to bear good fruit. We come to have communion, to be joined together with Jesus and with his body. And we come also to hope, to remember, have communion and hope that this miracle also leans forward into God's restoration of all things, into the very kingdom of God, that this meal is a celebration that leans into the heavenly banquet as we gather around that table with saints from every tribe and language and kingdom and people made one in Jesus to celebrate the marriage supper of the Lamb, to celebrate the day when all is made good and right again, and to be fed now in order that we might live toward it. This is a meal of remembrance and communion and hope. Let's pray together. Holy and right it is in our joyful duty to give thanks to you at all times and in all places, O Lord, our Creator, almighty and everlasting God. You've made the heavens with all their hosts and the earth with all its plenty. You have given us life and being, and you preserve us by your providence. But as we sang in our first hymn this morning, you've shown us the fullness of your love by sending into the world your Son, Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh for us and for our salvation, and for the precious gift of this mighty Savior who has reconciled us to you, who has paid the ransom, we offer ourselves as living sacrifices proclaiming the mystery of the faith that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again. So, Lord, send your Holy Spirit upon us, we pray, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, and grant that we might grow up in all things into Christ, who is our Lord. And as these grains were gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, Grant, O Lord, that your church may be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Even so, come and come soon, Lord Jesus. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. And I'll invite you to do this with me. He took bread. And after he had given thanks for it, He broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, after they'd eaten, he took the cup. And he said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Friends, the bread we break and the cup of blessing for which we bless God, these are the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is Christ's table and he welcomes us to it, giving himself to us. And so all who trust in Christ for their salvation are welcome to come and eat heartily and drink deeply of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I'll invite you now to take the bread the body of Christ given for you, and the cup, the blood of Christ shed for you, and to remember the promises of God that are made real in us. And so let's lift our lives in prayer. Pray with me. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And all that is within me, bless God's holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul. And do not forget all God's benefits. 
who forgives all your iniquity, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with steadfast love and with mercy. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless God's holy name. Lord, we bless you with the psalmist in response for all that you have poured into our lives. We pour our lives back out in gratitude. We thank you for these promises made visible in bread and in cup that you have given your life as a ransom for ours, not just to rescue us out of slavery, but to provide a way an abundant and everlasting life forward. We bless you, O God for this and for all the ways we have seen you at work in our lives and the world. And we pray, Lord, that you would keep it up, that you would send your spirit and bring your kingdom, that more and more we may see you at work in front of us and struggle to keep up. So, Lord, we pray this week for the Leonard and Williams families as they mourn the loss of a loved one, We pray for all who are grieving and pray that you would comfort those who mourn as you have promised. We pray too for those who need you to be at work in their lives in a special way this week. For Michael and Carolyn, for Dick and Brad and Eileen, and for so many more that we could each name ourselves and those we know and love who are empty vessels and need you, Lord, this week to fill us up again. Lord, come by your grace and be faithful to your promises. Lord, we pray for this community as well, as we are in the heart of summer, as many are traveling. We pray for your mercies and your safety to be upon them. We pray that this season would be one of rest and renewal, that we would enter, Lord, into Sabbath rhythms and remember that we are not made for work, but for a rhythm of work and rest as we give our lives for you and your glory. We pray as many begin to prepare for another school year for wisdom, for peace, for all that is still unknown about what will be. We pray for our community more broadly as fear and anxiety begin to enter into the conversation again with another variant of a disease that spreads among us. Lord, bring peace, your peace that surpasses all understanding. Give us the wisdom to know how to act wisely and to still trust that you are God and alive and well and at work in all things. Show us, Lord, how to love our neighbors and to give our lives not for our own good and betterment, but for theirs, as you yourself have done. And Lord, to the ends of the earth, earth, may this be your church's goal, to love you and to love our neighbors well, to follow after your spirit that is the breath in our lungs and the wind in our sails, and to go, Lord, to bring restoration and healing in the midst of all the darkness, all the death and debt and slavery of this world. Lord, you have fed us at your table. So now send us out as we pray the prayer that you yourself have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy Thy will be done. done on earth earth as it is in heaven. Give Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.